and welcome to El Oso Fumar Takes. This is our 97th take, live from Euless, Texas. I'm your host, Barry Duplissy, as always, and I'm so proud, so pleased, and so privileged to be with you all tonight. I am super excited for this night's show. I am super excited for this guest, and I'm so excited to be bringing him to you tonight. And before I get to him, we do have to thank the people that make this show go, and that is, of course, our sponsors. And tonight's show is sponsored by Drew Estate. In late October, so just a few weeks ago, Drew Estate announced the expansion of Acid Accents, the program to new regions including California, the Chicago area, Georgia, and my home state of Texas. The Acid Accents program provides Drew Diplomat retailers with a regionally exclusive cigar. The first two Acid Accents, the J Street Posse for the New York City area, and the Be More 410 for Maryland were showcased at this previous uh, trade show in Las Vegas. Uh, IPCPR, now PCA. Today's expanded line includes the California's ex exclusive, the All City, which is wrapped in a lush Indonesian wrapper and is combined with a unique acid infusion. All City is a term used in graffiti to show that your art can be seen everywhere, and the acid All City has been seen throughout the state of California. Next up is the Acid Pilsen, named after the eclectic and cosmopolitan art district in Chicago, and it features a creamy Ecuadorian Connecticut wrapper. For our Southern Acid fans, the Drew Estate announced the Acid A-Town for all of Georgia. The cigar, the cigar showcases a bright Indonesian wrapper in a 6x50 Toro format, and for my home state of Texas, they presented the Acid True Get, a 6x60, of course, Gordito wrapped in a silky Ecuadorian Connecticut wrapper and a, featuring a bold infusion. So check out your Drew Diplomat retailer for the new acid accents and you'll be pleased to smoke them. Um, additionally, I got to say, we I re really appreciate everyone who's tuning in on our Facebook Live tonight. Really appreciate all those who uh, will catch us later on YouTube. But if you're listening to us wherever you listen to podcasts, whether that's Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Play, Podbean, wherever you listen to podcasts, you're listening to us because exclusively because of Cornelius and Anthony Premium Cigars. Cornelius and Anthony Premium Cigars is steeped in tobacco tradition. For over 150 years, the Bailey family has been a part of America's tobacco heritage, passionately caring for the land they cultivate in Keysville, Virginia. Cornelius and Anthony's devotion to the finest grown tobacco and foremost aspects of craftsmanship allows them to introduce the most exquisite cigars to the market. They invite you to enjoy their portfolio of premium hand-rolled cigars and experience their dedication to producing an exceptional product. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. This is our 97th take. So excited, so pleased, so proud to have you all with us. And it's it's my pleasure to introduce our guest tonight, uh, a gentleman who I was really excited that agreed to be on the show. It was my Absolute pleasure to sit down with him at this past year's trade show and is a thrill tonight to introduce you to Luciano Mayrellis of Ace Prime Cigars. Luciano, how are you doing tonight? Man, honored to be here, man. Honored to uh, be with you, man. We, uh, we had such a great time in, in our previous conversations that I was looking forward for today. The, uh, the pleasure is absolutely mine, Luciano. And I got, and I got to say, um, I mean, first off, belated happy birthday for you. I know you had a amazing shindig um at club macanudo no less no less how was that how was uh how was the how was the party and how was your birthday it was outstanding man it was outstanding what macanudo did it was like phenomenal we had a house completely packed um and a lot of friends show up people from all over the world which was amazing a couple surprises so it was very meaningful you know? We had, a, we had a great time. I gotta yeah. say, there, there. If you're gonna have a, if you're gonna have a cigar birthday party, there are a few venues in the world that like just like are it. And I got, you know, Club Macanudo has got to be up there for most people. If you're like wanting to have like an iconic birthday for like cigar smokers, just in general, right? So, uh, yeah. like, have you? It, 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 was that your first time having your birthday party there, or? Was uh, was this very special because of you know H Prime's launch this year, or what, you know what was it all about? Yeah, I think uh, it was actually a coincidence. Um, we we were talking about dates for uh, launching H Prime cigars, and when they uh, when they showed us the dates, I said, "Man, this is exactly my birthday week." Um, so Gavin, who's the manager there, immediately said, "Well, let's celebrate your birthday here then." Uh, <laughs> Was uh, was quite interesting. Actually, we had two events there: one on the 19th and 
we had yesterday, which was amazing, by the way. Um, we can talk about it. I did a, a full like for uh, we actually created a uh, like chef's menu and a sommelier menu. So I paired our cigars with their, their food and also with wines and spirits. It was a great night. Wonderful, man. That sounds like, uh, that sounds like, well, it definitely sounds like my type of evening. So I'm sorry that I missed out. I know I got the official invite from you, so I, I felt yes, bad that did. I couldn't join, but, uh, but uh, I, I got to say, I'm really, really excited to kind of talk about a few things, of course, about Ace Prime tonight. But one thing we, t we kind of talked about a little bit before, and I've been telling people uh, to tune in because I was really excited about talking about this was um, you actually have met Pope Francis. <laughs> You've met the Pope. <laughs> You got to tell me what that experience was like. I mean, his holiness. I mean, that's, I'm not Catholic, uh, but I mean, wow. I mean, talk about, I mean, one of the most iconic beings on the planet today. I mean, that must have been such an incredible experience. Well, how did that come about? Well, uh, it's an interesting story. Uh, everything started with uh, the desire that I had to, uh, create a nonprofit called Chasing Justice. Um, and I was on board of a, another organization called Justice Conference, which was connected with World Relief, basically doing refugee settlements here in the United States and, and abroad. Um, and um, <laughs> it's a crazy story. Like, I'm talking about 12, 15 years ago, I, I meet this amazing bishop um, who was a Brazilian guy. And he was, uh, he's actually was just a priest at that time. And then he became a bishop. And then now he's one of the closest cardinals to the Pope. Uh, and we, we were just, we were just became friends in a fight. I mean, I was flying from, uh, I was from Miami to Sao Paulo. Um, and the guy sat next to me and we started talking about theology and philosophy. And uh, I knew he was a, he was a priest, of course. He was like, you know, all dressed up and stuff. Um, so we talked. And then, you know, later on, um, when we started this nonprofit organization, and of course, we had some other different connections, friends in common and stuff. Um, I actually just basically asked him, I said, you know, can you set up a private audience with the Pope? Um, surprisingly, surprisingly, I got the invitation uh, a few days <laughs> after my request. And then it became, it became a tradition. Like I, I go every year, every November uh, around Thanksgiving, uh, with the exception of this year for, uh, for several reasons, but every year I go there and I represent our organization or I go just to kind of really refresh. And, and, uh, and it's been an amazing opportunity uh, to see him. You know, last year I took Tiago with me uh, and he, uh, he actually gave a, Gave the Pope a Nets ball, uh, which was kind of interesting. <laughs> he, was like, he, was hanging, he was like holding the ball. He didn't know what to do with the ball. <laughs> it was it was, uh, it was very interesting. <laughs> yeah. Oh man, what an experience it was for him, I'm sure too. But I, I, but I, 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 I've never been to the Vatican. I, it's one of the places I've I've always wanted to see. I just just the the art. The history. I mean, just I'm a, I'm a history buff. That's like that's my that's my thing, and most of our most of our audience knows that. Mm -hmm. Um, but I, I just still I still can't wrap my mind around meeting one of the most like what you could consider to be the most iconic people on the planet today. And you know, like mm -hmm. you talk about the Pope, and and I mean he he is a symbol of of so much goodness and so much grace, mm -hmm. and for you know one billion Catholics. I mean, that's, he's the figurehead and, yeah. and to, to have an audience with him and, and to make it an annual thing. I mean, that's, yeah, that's you know what? I, I, humbling. I, that, that actually brings up something that means a lot to me. Um, I know he runs an institution and he is a tremendous, uh, I mean, it is a big thing meeting with the Pope, but we, sometimes we forget that all these people, they are human beings. And, um, and we forget this humane side of, uh, of people. So when I first met him, the first thing I said, and I don't even know why, it was just kind of, I don't know, maybe it was the, maybe it was the Holy Spirit who <laughs> inspired me to do that. I look at him, I look in his eyes, 
And I said, uh, your holiness, can I break the protocol and give you a hug? That's what I said. And then he looked in my eyes and said, yes, of course. So <laughs> I hugged the Pope. And then, uh, it, you know, it was funny because uh, actually I, there, was a, there, there was a common friend from Argentina who I knew uh, before. And uh, the guy said, well, let me see him. Tell him I, I said hi. And as soon as I mentioned my friend's name, like he, he faces changes. And like he starts smiling and he hugs me. And um, it, it was so nice to see that he is a, a, he's a human being and he has a, such a wonderful heart. You know, just talking to him for 10 minutes was one of the most special things that ever happened to my life. I, I, I just simply can't imagine. I, 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 this Pope in particular, um, just for, for, so many, for so many reasons, I think is uh, one of those things that I, I just, I, I, I bet it was just so, so humbling. And that's, that's awesome that you had that, not only that experience, but that, that personal experience with him, mm -hmm. you know, that, that you kind of made it your own. And, and again, the fact that you continue to get to meet with him and everything, what a, what a tremendous story. But, you know, the only, the other thing that's a tremendous story, of course, is, is, was this year's 2019 IPCPR, you know, we, um, you know, the cigar industry has kind of uh, been in this, you know, for lack of a better word, this rut, not because there's been this lack of creativity or this lack of great cigars. Of course, you know, there's been amazing creativity and amazing creation of cigars for the last few years and everything. But there's been this, this cloud, this, this, this black cloud hanging over the industry with the deeming regulations of the FDA. And, mm -hmm. and you just haven't seen the launch of many new brands um, and then 2019 comes along and we have this explosion uh, in the form of Ace Prime. And uh, you're at, of course, at the head of it. And uh, so before we get into just what that was all about, when did you decide to get into the cigar industry? That's a long story. And I'll, I'll tell you the short version. Um, so I was, I, I was, in DR and Dominican Republic back in 2007 for the first time. And I went into this called business mission. Uh, one of my, say my core business was consultancy and uh, which is kind of similar to lobbying, but to the private side. So I would bring companies uh, from different sectors, from different private companies to be, to really get established in, uh, in, you know, different countries in Latin America, Central America, or Europe. Um, so I was kind of really involved into this kind of business. That's kind of what helped me funded, fund all the different things. Um, and I see myself in the center of a, um, basically a economic crisis in, in, in uh, Dominican Republic. So they're going through a lot of hardships, and one of the main things for them that was really important was to kind of fight the, the taxes barriers in South American countries. And because I went to this mission and they knew that that was my expertise, so I got hired by the Dominican uh, Republic government to uh, fight taxes uh, in Brazil and Argentina. Uh, so I, I basically worked for the, for the government for a couple of years there, and that's how I met. Uh, my friend Ernesto Carrillo, and actually the, there's a guy watching us right here, which will will be will be able to even tell the story from a different angle. Um, he's a marine, a passionate guy for cigars. His name is Brian Seville. Uh He came to me one day and said, "Oh, I know you've been working with DR, so why don't you why don't we go there and maybe start a brand of cigars?" And honestly, for me at that time, it was basically just really trying to uh, help my friend and, and maybe create a nonprofit, you know, kind of to help the villagers there, help people. Um, but we went there and I, I really fell in love for cigars and uh, I've, I've smoking cigars for my, my entire life. You know, I'm 44 now. I think I smoked cigars since I was 18 years old. Um, so for me, it was, uh, it was an old brainer, you know, of course I want to visit the factory, of course I want to get together with this guy. And at that time it was kind of, it was kind of easy for us because we had support of the government. I was working for them. So they were always, they were basically care of us and took us everywhere. 
but Carillo was the one who I really empathized with and we became friends and, and he, he kind of, uh, I would say, mentored me in, in the business. Um, and because he was, he was just starting by career Alianza in 2009. Um, and because he, he has, he sold his brand and he has that kind of sort of quarantine that he has to, he had to kind of, he could not produce any cigars for a certain period of time. And then after that was expired, he started the, the Bacalera Alianza and it was just a blessing, you know, I was lucky to, to have met Ernesto and that's kind of where everything started. What was it like? Uh, I mean, I mean, I mean, Ernesto. Everyone knows my my affinity for for him in particular. But you know, I mean, this like as you mentioned, he's a, he's a legend in the business. You know, what was it like to, you know, kind of, you know, study under and get tutelage from you know from one of the industry's best? I mean, that that had to be, uh, again, kind of you know, not to keep using the word, but I mean, that had to be humbling in a certain sense, but also. Uh, uh, motivational too, to that someone, uh, someone of his stature was willing to help you out and help you get started. No, absolutely. So we, so I, we built our first blend with Ernesto and, um, and I also met some great people along the way. And one of them is Pichardo. So when Ernesto, uh, got the, I think it was the second cigar of the year. I mean, number two cigar of the year, 2000 and, Oh, I think La Storia, right? Yeah, last two thousand. Yeah. yeah, I believe so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, somewhere around that. So he came to us. He said, like he could not produce our cigars anymore because we were too small, and he was really cut up with a lot of things. He could not. So, um, he, but he never, never withdraw his support. Even now, when we launched Ace Prime, if you, if you look online, you see this beautiful, so uh, you know, support this beautiful endorsement that he did for us during the IPCPI and to the press, and press releases and stuff. So I'm thankful, man. I, that, that man, I, I call him my padrino. So he's my godfather. And, uh, and I, I, met, I met Pichardo in this process. And Pichardo, he's one of the latest Cubans that left uh, Cuba around 2007 as well. He, he was the master blender that worked together with our son Ramos uh, for his entire life. He's also a third generation uh, tobacconist, more like an agricultural side. Mm -hmm. um, but he was working at Havana SA, basically blending the D4 and the two parties. So <laughs> Pichardo was already a legend known in Europe, Eastern Europe, China. Again, just like, his, just like you and I were talking before, you know, completely under the radar. But he's uh, Pichardo is really well known in Eastern Europe. Europe, everybody knows whoever you know interacts with Havana SA knows knows Pichardo. Of course, here in America, fortunately, we cannot have Cuban tobacco. But he uh, uh, he was a big name at Havana. So I I was lucky to have him since the beginning, and we started the factory together. We started with a, with four tables in Nicaragua, producing forty thousand cigars a year, and now we produce five million. Well, that's an that's an incredible jump. So, what what uh, what caused the move from you know you you started you got your start in the Dominican Republic. What was it about Nicaragua that enticed you to move with Pichardo to start the factory there? I think it was Arsenio. Basically, Arsenio was working uh, with uh, Eduardo Fernandez, uh, um, and Pichardo was his pupil. You know, it was his uh, uh, it was his friend and. Pichardo just felt like more confident to go to Nicaragua instead of DR when he moved out of Cuba. Um, and, you know, I think it was a convergence of factors. You know, Nicaraguan cigars was, was, was a big hit too. And there's more opportunities also for us to do good there. Um, one, one of the things we care about, and, and sometimes, you know, we talk a lot about this and, and people really don't, don't pay attention to it. Uh, we really care about the people that is involved in this process, you know, and that's how we started. As I told you, for me, it was never about profit at the beginning. Of course, we realized that becoming for profit we could help more people. We could actually help the communities. We could develop something big. Uh, then we changed, but uh, I mean, we haven't changed anything in our hearts. And I think Pichardo has the same heart I do. Brian, who is our partner as well, and uh, you know, Tiago. I think we all we're all on the same page when it comes to people. So for me, and 
sounds cheesy, but I, 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 and that's, I don't even have merit for it because that's how my brain is wired. And maybe that's why I, I, I end up having so many friends, celebrity friends. And, and it's because I just see them as human beings. I don't, I don't talk to them. I talk to mind why, you know, I'm not other and not over. It's just like, I, I, I have a relationship with some of my employees that are exactly on the same level that I have with so many kind of what you would consider high profile, you know? No, so I, I, it's, it's not because I'm, I'm, I'm the nicest person on earth. You know, I have a lot of, lot of flaws, my friend, but it's just because I, I, um, that's how my brain's wired. It's kind of weird. I think. <laughs> I, I think that that's, um, I, I mean, I think those are some exceptional qualities that you kind of explained there in the mm -hmm. likeness of, of the people you surrounded yourself with. I, I'm skipping ahead here from what we kind of talked about, but I, I, I remember sitting down with you and uh, Tiago and uh, Dominique at uh, the IPCPR trade show. And that was something that uh, left out at me when I was talking specifically to Tiago about his motivations and in getting involved with the company. Mm -hmm. And it, it for a while for you know as he was kind of answering and everything he didn't say anything about tobacco he didn't say anything about cigars he certainly didn't say anything about money he was talking about what he was able what this project was able to do and how many people was able to help out uh the people that you know that worked in the factory the the the, the uh, community behind it and that was that was the main reason that he got involved and that was what he found motivating in all of this. And then we finally talked about his cigar. Um, yeah. So it was, it, it was kind of a, it was kind of an, I, I won't say afterthought because it was obviously the focal point of why we were there talking, but, um, but his motivation was, was clearly intentional and, 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 and you just talking right there kind of very, very, very similar. Is that where you guys were kind of drawn to each other was the, your, your, your love yeah. of charity and, and, and the, the wanting to help? Um, that would sound like a very nice story to tell, right? <laughs> but it's not, it's not, it's not actually the, it's not the reason. Um, I think the reason it was our friendship was the fact that we wanted to build a business. I was already, uh, we, we, we were already producing for all these brands and, uh, and the factory was doing well, but Tiago was the one who convinced me to, uh, to launch the brands. So he's the one who came to me a couple of years ago and said, man, you should launch, you should launch your, your own brands. We should launch our brands. So he was more like towards the business side. Uh, but of course he understand this was very holistic for us. I, I don't see, I, I don't have a, I don't have a compartment in my brain where it says charitable and a compartment that says for profit. For me, everything is kind of organic. So I look at, I look at the industry and I, I know the jobs can be created. I know if the more expand, the more fair wages can be paid in Nicaragua because unfortunately not everybody, take care of their people and, and pay their wages. So I want to grow. I want to grow. I want to make money. I want people of Nicaragua to benefit from it. So, you know, yeah, I mean, I would say that Diago has the same heart. That's no questions about it. No question about it. He does, he does have the same heart. And, and it's, it's also about the passion. We talk, a lot, we talk about passion and love. We say we love pizza and, and we love our wives, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, the passion here I love is both that, those things, just for the record. Yes, I, I, me too. But you know, we should use different words for it. Uh, but like, I, I feel like um, there's something in this industry that's so special, which is the, the true passion. If you talk to our Senator Ramos, he used to say that there's two types of tobaccos the one that's just for the money, you know, the business one, and the ones that are really passion. They just cannot do anything else but work with tobacco because that's their life and their passion. They see everything in tobacco. They write poems about tobacco. They create analogies to uh, their relationships about tobacco, friendship. Everything is connected with, connected with, with tobacco, with cigars, and, and their lives is built, the narrative of their lives is built upon the culture of, of cigars. And so, and I would say that we have great people on this second category but of course we have a lot of people who are just for the business uh, but you know I feel like the the passion that the people and and, I'll, and I think you understand when I give it this example and some people that are watching has maybe heard me saying this before I don't say much um, but we do have like a uh, I have an employee she is about 60 
something, 62, maybe 63 years old. And I never really pay attention to her because she's such an amazing uh, roller. Um, so she's always doing everything right, like zero hechasso, uh, which is, you know, the cigars that don't, that doesn't go through quality control. They, they have to be re-rolled. She has like zero. She's perfect. She's the perfect roller uh, that we have in my factory. And she's always sitting there, always working hard, eight hours. She stops her lunch, come, come back and work. And I, I keep, I was always asking Pichard, I say, man, why, she's so old, why doesn't she retire or can we do something for her? She doesn't have to work anymore. And he's like, and Pichard always said, Luciano, don't take this from her. She'll be devastated. Don't take this from her. Until one day, and I was so insistent, one day I get to the factory and I decided to talk to her. It was the end of the shift, about like five o'clock. She stood up. And, and I'm going to remove this just to show you what she did. Like she, she stood up and then I, I, I kind of reached for her hand. And then when I, when I got her hand, her elbows could not actually move. She has this basically a movement res restriction. She could not like move her hands. And I got so pissed. I said, you know, why? You know, you don't have to do this. I'll pay your salary. Just go home, please. Enjoy your family. You don't have to come here. She broke in tears immediately. And she said exactly what Pichardo told me. Don't take this away from me. And it's her pride. It's, the, it's her, I mean, her daughter works with her. Her granddaughter works in the factory. It's oh like a gosh. family tradition. It's a family pride, you know? And then that kind of clicked in my head right away. I said, you know what? It is about passion. It is about passion. And, and you know, unfortunately, uh, not everybody has the same mentality, but I think the majority do, especially Nicaragua. I think the Nicaraguan family, it's, it's really tight. That's why we get so much uh, support and all these endorsements and, and people who know us there uh, since the beginning, you know? Um, so, yeah. That's why I love, I love hearing stories like that, uh, Luciana, because I think that that is something that gets kind of lost in the, the minutia for lack of a better word, you know, when we're, for the people who kind of get into cigars, they start, they start smoking, they start enjoying different cigars and they start branching off and trying more and different. Then they start maybe reading about this and then they get to know the people behind it and mm -hmm. they meet people like you or, um, you know, or Terrence Riley of Vaganorsa, who, you know, you were talking about Arsenio Ramos a moment ago. Arsenio was a name that was known, but he, you know, even him, he spent his days in the factory yeah. and they get to know these people, they get to know these people, but it's, it's people like that employee. Uh, it, it reminds me of when uh, the time that I actually got to tour Davidoff and I met a man that Klaus Kellner, uh, you know, Hanky Kellner's son said was the most invaluable person to the company. And it wasn't his father. He was talking a man whose name literally is Superman. He showed his driver's license and everything. His name was Superman. And <laughs> he was, uh, he, his, his knowledge of tobacco uh, mm -hmm. is just, Un unbelievable and um and it's it's stories about this lady and her family that work for you and, and superman and people like that 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 is truly mm -hmm. what makes this industry um not just go that just sounds so cheap but it meaningful moves it in a, in a in a different way and i'm not just talking about forward but it just it moves this industry yeah i agree 100 percent uh Arsenio is special, man. Arsenio, he was so underrated. Uh, always behind the scenes, always. People have no idea how many blends that man created for Arganosa. He was behind the blends. I mean, I, with all the respect to Eduardo, Eduardo is a great tobacconist. But I, I can tell you, and you can, I, you can ask anyone in that factory, Eduardo would never release one single cigar the first wasn't blended by Arsenio or had a set Arsenio's approval. And that, I think that was the genius of Arsenio too, because he kind of reinvented himself because he, when he was, when he was in Cuba, he was known for, for, for fermentation. Like that was his thing. And then he kind of reinvented himself into this blender. And, and, you know, for people who are like, think that that's like second nature, like consider your employee that you were just talking about her life's work is rolling. It'd be like her picking up her, getting up from her rolling station one day and then going over and 
going over to fermentation or, or something mm-hmm. different, completely different within the factory. Yes, she's working with tobacco, but it's completely different. Um, but, you know, it, they, but there's one thing that you should consider. A lot of people think that blending is just getting leaves and putting them together. But I can get a, I can get a Jalapa uh, Viso or Hero, and I can ferment with completely different processes and for different times, and they give me a completely different taste profile. So I said he was, when, when we say he was strong in fermentation, it means like he was a complete master blender because that guy knew exactly how to produce flavors by curating the tobacco properly. And also, he, he invented something that we use in our factory, and I you know a lot of people do, but this was Arsenio's invention. He created something called the anaerobic fermentation of tobacco. Nobody knew how to do this. Um, he basically, after the guys were rolled, he would, uh, he would actually uh, put every, everything in plastic bags, remove all the oxygen, and leave for three months without oxygen. And I ask him, why? How, why do you do this? You know, are you kind of, it's something about the humidity, the heat. He said, no, it's because there is a gas interchange. And when you remove the oxygen, uh, you kind of help the yeast to take over. So a, a, a tobacco leaf, there's always this fight, even in our, in our bodies, we always have this fight of the bacteria versus the yeast. Uh, if you take too much antibiotics for infection or something, mm-hmm. uh, you could be more susceptible to yeast infections, skin rash, that kind of stuff, because you basically uh, killing all the antibiotics and, and letting the yeast take over. That's why you have to take something for your stomach, you feel kind of sick, you're killing the good bacteria of your, of your body. And the tobacco leaf, which is one of the uh, only botanical species that ferments while alive, um, it's that fight, and the yeast take over. It's just like wine. You know, the yeast take over. They win the bacteria, then you have a good tobacco leaf. So he kind of created this process, which changes the taste profile completely, and and, and blends so well. Uh, and now everybody is using it, from padron to like you know, so we do that. We do that with, with some brands, some blends as well. It's interesting what the uh, the next generation is going to do as far as contributing. As far as that, that's a that's a far deeper conversation and and probably one that that uh, that would exceed the, the length of this podcast. But um, it's incredible what the, the the great people did before us, and you know the the later Arsenio Ramos. Uh, just what we'll we'll never. F- I don't think that most people will fully understand what he contributed to the industry. And it's, it's yeah. great to hear stories like that, to, to hear just yeah. simple things like that and what he's doing for you and your factory as well. I mean, that's incredible. And without so, expecting anything in return, just for the, just for the sake of the art. So there was, I was not giving anything to, to Arsenio. And even if you talk to Eduardo, Arsenio would be happy with a ticket back to Cuba twice a year to visit his family and a very modest salary in Nicaragua. <laughs> it's crazy. It's crazy. And, and, and people have no idea how much that man contributed to the industry. Like it's all about passion. Well, speaking of that, and speaking of that hard work and that passion, you know, so 2019 is we kind of, I kind of started this conversation with has this, we have this black cloud that's sitting over the industry with the FDA deeming regulations and everything. And so 2019, you and your partners decide to launch and what a launch it was ACE prime at this year's past IPCPR trade show. And I mean, uh, first of all, hats off to you for uh, an incredible presentation, booth presentation, all of your products you guys even had a half court basketball court uh because of uh, two of your partners uh i mean i mean all you guys were missing were fireworks and and maybe i missed them maybe you did have but i mean there were plenty of fireworks to be had i why so i mean a a question you've answered probably a dozen Mm -hmm. dozen times if not more and I, i know i asked you in the booth that day but i'd like my audience to hear it as well why 2019 luciano why are you starting well, this project? I think, uh, well, first of all, let's talk about this, this cloud that you just 
mentioned. Um, of course, in, in times where fear is predominant, uh, from a business standpoint, that's where opportunities are. So, uh, and I, I have no problem with going against the current um, and, and take risks when I, uh, when I am confident. You know, I, I really feel uh, very much confident that it, we couldn't do this in a better time. And I'll explain. Uh, first, because uh, I think there is a lot of speculation about what the law is. And of course, we talked to a lot of lawyers. We talked to, I had at least seven legal opinions about that matter. And nothing is really clear. There's still interpretations. And even the FDA went back and forth with some of those interpretations. Uh, and we know, and I tried to look at this with a more sort of a macro lens, like what's the trend around the world? So if you eat anything today, uh, if you want to control the ingestion of sugar or how much fat you have in a, and you, you, you definitely want to look at the label of the, that product and to find out how much fat, sugar, you want to know what you put in your mouth. And we cannot reverse that. Everybody wants to know what they're putting in their mouths. So if you ask me, and I know it's very controversial, and I, I had some of the guys of the, of the PCA, I was going to say, I, coming to my birthday party in the 19th, one of them was uh, Joshua, who is the, the director for the federal affairs for the PCA. And I was telling him, and, and I said, I think actually you guys uh, did the wrong move. Yeah. And in, instead of embracing the regulation which let's let's be honest here the european market it's almost entirely regulated central america is regulated south america even like i i, I have a client in brazil we work for this client since the beginning it's 12 years and every single cigar i have to send to london to have to be to have the chemical analysis done by a third party bring it back had it approved by the local fda then I can commercialize that cigar in Brazil. So this is not something new. And of course, you know, that narrative is not so popular. Uh, <laughs> maybe because I work with so many um, international organizations in a, in, in a high level. So I, I kind of, it's easier for me to see that way. And I'm not saying I'm right. I'm telling you my interpretation of the future, what I believe will happen in the future. We cannot avoid regulation. Now, our mistake was to not control the narrative. And I have friends who are in the very high seats on Philip Morris. It's one of the largest, if not the largest, tobacco company in the world. Those guys elect eight senators who happen to be in the health community. So they lobby. And do you know what they're lobbying right now? They are the ones behind the increase of age for cigarettes from 18 to 21. They are the ones who are telling the Congress, we agree with you. Mm -hmm. In fact, we think you have to be 21 to make a decision, a proper decision about consumption of tobacco. So in this way, they present the bill and they create the narrative, they control the narrative. They say, I agree you have to be regulated in this terms, which of course have been exhaustively discussed with lawmakers to really pass the law. So instead of aligning with them, we are saying they are bad guys. They are killing people. They are causing cancer. We are different. We have we are tobacco wrapped in tobacco. And this entire narrative, we think it's good, but it's so complicated. You have to explain to everybody, you know, that we don't inhale cigars. And then we, we explain to all politicians today and then Two years from now, politicians are different. They just forget about it. They don't care. What they care is what's going to resonate to their electoral college, and that's it. So either you really plan a strategy and you do lobby right, or uh, you're going to always react instead of act. So what, what, have we, how, what have we achieved as an industry? Because remember, we are, we are, we're really small compared to... Um, 
other tobacco products such as uh, cigarettes and now a vape. Um, so what, what, what kind of narrative have we created? It's zero. We just reacted. We're just saying, you know, the FDA that we should not be regulated. And then we postpone and we delay and we postpone and we delay. And we think we're doing a good service to the industry. In my opinion, we do a disservice to the industry because the sooner the better. So answering your question, we, we chose, <laughs> it was not planned to be 2019. We did it because we wanted to launch our brands. We decided to take a risk and face and get prepared. So I can tell with confidence that we are very much prepared to what's coming. We believe that um, all the factors will have to comply with the same thing. And, and basically there'll be no, in, in my opinion, in, in, of at least five of our lawyers we consult with, there's no difference of being grandfather or not. I mean, once if the interpretation of the substance equivalents, which now will be extended to the factories, uh, and that's the, the most recent interpretation. Um, basically, if you're a grandfather, the only difference is you don't have to take your product out of the shelf to comply with the regulation. Mm -hmm. if, you, if you are not grandfather and you haven't done your, anything, you have to pull your product out of the shelf, apply for the approval, and then you can put it back. So that can, that can break a lot of companies. And that's, that's why everybody is, is so afraid of the regulation but believe me bear the regulation will happen and, and it, it has to it's inevitable so why we why are we fighting so much instead of creating our own narrative you know I, I agree with you 100% that the uh, that a, a more proactive nature needs to take place. It's something that I've mm -hmm. talked uh, incessantly about in uh, other platforms as well mm -hmm. as this one. Um, I think I think you are right. I think we are we are a very reactive industry. And mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot that uh, can be said for for being proactive, and there's a lot that can be said about getting more people involved as well, and just understanding. You know, I think I, I think yeah. there there's such a lack of understanding, and even some of the things that you pointed out there, um, yeah. just the fact yeah. that like other mar other international markets, yeah, you're already, you're you know you're already doing this. Yeah, and we need unity here in this industry because. Again, we have the PCA who did an amazing job of putting people together and trying to defend our rights. Awesome. I, I think, you know, I think they're doing a good job with what they can. Then you see two big manufacturers doing one thing and getting together. Another group getting together here. The, the small ones lost. They don't know what to do. So, I mean, somehow, someone has to bring unity and people you know, gather everybody and really start working with a plan instead of just a, a reaction. I, I totally agree. Um, you know, speaking of getting together, you, you know, we've talked a little bit here tonight. We've, uh, we've got grabbed in bits and pieces of, of the amazing team that you're a part of and the partnerships that you've cultivated in launching Ace Prime. Uh, we've mentioned Tiago Splitter. Um, who is uh, he's your partner, and he's also the man behind uh, one of the lines that you launched at this year's I, uh, IPCPR, which was the MXS Tiago. Uh, of course, the other half of that uh, project was the MXS uh, Dominique, uh, of course, uh, Dominique Wilkins, uh, NBA Hall of Famer, Basketball Hall of Famer, and uh, who I also had the privilege of sitting down with. Um, these two cigars that you blended, um, Luciano, the, uh, I mean, two completely different uh, – uh, you know, representations of a cigar, very, very unique blends indeed. Mm -hmm. What was it like working with uh, these two specifically and the fact that they resulted in such uh, two completely different cigars, you know, were mm -hmm. you pleased with that, uh, that, that outcome and, uh, and, and how do you feel about going forward? Oh, yes, absolutely. I am very pleased with the results. Um, the, the Dominic Wilkins blend uh, it was a very interesting process. Uh, as I told you before, he, uh, we sent to him almost like 30 different blends and it was always something that he wanted to tweak and he would ask us and then we sent it back. So it was, was, a, was a very interesting, long process. Um, we always try to blend what we are capable of maintaining the consistency. And that's it. Everybody talks about that. But, but at the end of the day, if you don't control your process, if you don't have the a true vertical operation, it's almost impossible to control the consistency of a cigar. 
And we are blessed with the fact that we strengthen our industry for the past 12 years to be able to do this right now. And the 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 Dominic Wilkins is is such an amazing, I call it unresolved taste profile because it makes you really try to to understand the cigar and i like cigars that make you curious that makes you smoke more you want to know more about the cigar and and as you know i love pairing and blending and when you add a second element to the experience if you bring a stout beer to that cigar or a good coin which i had that day that was that, that's wonderful. right that's right I remember. <laughs> so it, it does resolve the flavor it anticipates the 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 result we expect which is that kind of resolution you know um so and that that cigar specifically uh we we try to create create a lot of salivation because very much necessary to open the thus the the uh, uh taste buds and the way we did it was this half leaf of ometepi you know ometepi is a it's a it's grown in a in a very volcanic soil in Nicaragua it's an island it's actually a volcano. So the island is a volcano, an active volcano. And, and everything we grow there um, has its unique salty magnesium, uh, you know, soldier chloride and magnesium. And Very sulfur. savory, powerful, yeah. robust so leaf, yeah. A lot of, some people try to do like 100% ometepi in a cigar. I think it's impossible to smoke. It's a lot of sulfur. It's just like wine from the Vesuvio in Italy. Like you have to open the bottle and leave it open for one day before you drink. So <laughs> we use a lot of metapi for blending, and and it's you know it's an amazing uh, it's an amazing leaf. When 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 I mix the ometapi with the Mexican San Andre wrapper and my Lijero from Jalapa, which is extremely sweet, that combination makes you salivate. It's 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 amazing. I mean the result we got. And that cigar with a taste profile and salivation without being an aggressive cigar, without being a overpowering cigar. It's medium. I, I consider that cigar a medium cigar for me. Some people say it's a medium full. I think it's a medium cigar and it, it's well aged. Uh, and that's another confusion that we have a lot in this market is when, when they feel something spicy and harsh, they think it's strong. Mm -hmm. But actually, I can, I can produce a harsh cigar by only adding raw tobacco and, and, and make it taste really harsh and spicy and there's no nicotine, you know? So with, that, with, Do, with Dominic Cigar, we have uh, a tremendously hero inside that cigar. It's one different hero, but it's, it's a powerful hero that's so aged. The average age in that cigar is four years and a half. So it's so a lot of aging. I think uh, I think you're bringing up a couple of great points there, Luciano. The the I think uh, in, in Ometepe is something that I, unfortunately I haven't discussed too much on the show, but mm -hmm. I am very familiar with it. And I think it, I think you bring about a great point. It is a very complementary tobacco. Mm -hmm. It, it uh, on its own, as you mentioned, you, you, it almost has a negative connotation to it. It's you know sulfuric, um, very you know can bring about a harshness and stuff. But when used correctly or used well. It can balance yep. out a really nice blend. Because when you start listing off those tobaccos, just in, if you're just on description, San Andreas, wrapper, Omentepe, and a Lajero, whether it's Yalapa yeah, or not, yeah, Yalapa yeah, is yeah, sweet, yeah. like you said. But yeah, Omentepe is the sickle. We use the Omentepe sickle on that one. So that's, that Omentepe sickle, which is just half leaf of Omentepe, create the, the amazing reaction. So the, this, there's a very, uh, if you know Nicaragua, Tobacco well as you do, you know that the condega is very, it's very easy to kind of right away. There's condega here or mm -hmm. stelly. I know there's a stelly here, especially if it's if it's the hair or if it's the the fillers, because you know stelly has, has a little more, uh, let's say, creates more impact, right? Mm -hmm. Well, the condega, it's it's that kind of also kind of sulfury a little bit, but it's more like flavorful. Uh, condega, it, it's a lot of flavor, the condega is very earthy. So what you taste in Do at Dominic's, it's that re the condega, I would say, Viso is something that's very much there. Uh, and the reaction between the Jalapa Lijero and the Ometepe Seco and the, the rapper um, Mexican Senators. 
Yeah, I really, I really truly enjoyed that cigar. And uh, as we mentioned, uh, you have another, uh, the other, the other cigar as well, the MXS Tiago. But uh, you actually uh, had mentioned to me before the show that uh, you actually have a uh, something, a new project in the MXS line that will be uh, will be worked on as well. Uh, would you care to share about that? Oh, of course. Um, so, well, you're going to be the first. Well, this, well, there's actually a second media outlet that I say this. I, I got to be precise. There. Uh, but he hasn't come out officially yet. We're sending the, the press release tomorrow. Um, we are actually, we already signed with Adrian Gonzalez, the baseball player, El Titan, QBR next MXS. And we have another surprise for next year will be a woman who will sign the MXS. Wonderful. The, well, that's fantastic. So and, and that's a guy would be all about woman empowerment, would not be a girly uh you know pink cigar you'll be actually a cigar that a man can smoke uh, anyone can smoke uh but would be a very strong woman will sign that cigar <laughs> well that's that's incredible so two more additions to the mxs line adrian gonzalez i i certainly uh while his time in uh with my my favorite team in boston wasn't uh, as herald as as it was supposed to be. I always thought he was a, a tremendous player. So, and I always had a great affinity for him. I thought he was great. And uh, I'm excited to see that he's, uh, he's come on board with you and, and help you continue the extension of that particular line. And then of course, uh, in addition to, addition to that line, that, which was probably had obviously the most mm -hmm. impact to use a word you said a moment ago uh, at the trade show, there were, there were tons of releases that you guys are coming out with, including something that uh, you're particularly proud of, uh, the regular production line of the uh, the Pichardo Classico, uh, the Pichardo mm -hmm. Reserva Familiar Connecticut, and uh, uh, the Familiar San Andreas, and then of yeah, course Habano. the uh, Familiar Habano, correct? Mm -hmm. So we are really proud of that cigar. Remember the process I told you about the the this little different fermentation process we do with the cigar. Uh, aging is the key here. Uh, and that's something that a few factories are doing today. And we're not, we don't rush that production. We just planned really well. So we, the cigars that are today in the market are cigars that we started uh, bunching and rolling two years ago. Those are the ones that are being released now. And we've been manufacturing continuously to make sure that all the cigars that are released pass through the same process. So we, we don't rush the process with the cigars. And we have an abundance. We've been producing a very good quantity to supply uh, the demand and we, are, we have a full stock in the factory just waiting to waiting for the demand to, to grow and so we can start shipping more. So those, those two guys are, are phenomenal. Well, what, well the, the, the Connecticut is not actually a full Connecticut, it's a hybrid Connecticut. Um, a lot of people don't understand that, we just say Connecticut, but it's a 75% Connecticut, 25% of Rana. Um, is a hybrid that we created. Uh, Pichardo developed that for many years. Uh, he has the uh, preparatory ownership of that of that seed. We grow that in, in Ecuador. We trade that tobacco a lot with, with a lot of colleagues there in Stali. And that hybrid uh, gave us the opportunity to develop a medium full blend with Connecticut rep. And then, of course, you have the other two lines. They are phenomenal as well. The, the Avano is also in the medium full range. And the uh, Pichardo San Andres. Pichardo San Andres today is our best seller. I, I, that doesn't surprise me, given the, uh, given the market and their affinity for, for a little bit mm -hmm. more robust, flavorful, flavorful cigars. But mm -hmm. uh, um, I think that uh, I, th these are these are these are blends that are kind of indicative of your background because, as you mentioned, you got your start in the Dominican Republic. You moved to production to Nicaragua. You've garnered influence from uh, you know people of Cuban heritage and other heritages, and and and, and uh, you know these are really diverse blends. I mean, we mm -hmm. yes, there's a there's a there's a stronger influence of Nicaraguan, I would say, but mm -hmm. I mean, you use Dominican tobacco. You have mm -hmm. a heavy uh, influence on Sumatran. You Ecuadorian Sumatran is is a leaf that you yeah. have an affinity for. I'd like to talk about your project, though, specifically a cigar that I truly enjoy. We talked about it before uh, before we went live tonight. The the Luciano the Traveler, uh, which is a limited last week. limited cigar. Yeah, 
<laughs> so is this limited a, is this limited production or is this a, a limited edition like kind of a one and done deal uh what, what's the production on that specifically so here's the thing and uh you notice that i'm all about uh, revealing and unveiling elements of the industry including my cigars so what i do in my events uh if you come to my events i basically deconstruct all my cigars in front of people what most of the tobacco is they hate it because you never know what you are if you're roller you know messed up with something or cheated here and there but i'm willing to take the risk i i really i unveil my cigar i bring leaf by leaf i do pairings uh and sometimes i rebunch them sometimes i create different blends using the leaves of a cigar they are just deconstructed and i've been doing this in several shops and people love it of course and that's why we do it uh, but it helps them to understand the process of, of a cigar many you know manufacturing as well and, but I also like to talk about some things uh, uh, of the of the background of the of the industry. I'm not afraid of talking about because I think people should know. Um, so with the Luciano, which is the the limit series, uh, the the hundred percent Pelo de Oro. Pelo de Oro, it is a very uh, difficult leaf to grow. It's it's very yeah. difficult. Very low species. yields. Yeah. yeah. Very, very low yields. Um, and basically what happens with this leaf, and we tried in Nicaragua several times. They are Pildoro from Nicaragua, very small yields, like you said. Um, but they don't taste as the Peruvian or the Equatorian. And there's a reason for it. Uh, the Pildoro de Oro traditionally is very acidic. So uh, it's a, it has a high pH. Mm -hmm. uh, on the leaf uh, after the fermentation for some reason that species that really really uh, really acidic that's why if you get the uh, I remember like many years ago and that's the only remembrance I have of this uh, the original uh, Puro Hobaina uh, I think it was back in 1992 1991 and there was 100% Pelo de Oro and I remember that I heterohaled it and I felt my nose like burning, like, like you know, could feel all the acidity in my, in my nose. And I love it. I love it. I said, you know, this, this tobacco is amazing. You Sign know, me up. Because <laughs> I, I have kind of this, this weird brain too uh, with, with sounds and, and, and smells and tastes. That's why I love wine and I love to pair things and create. I'm passionate about flavor, basically. That's that's that should be my short answer to your question: How I got into the industry. I'm passionate for flavors, so I, I fell in love with tobacco, and I um, and then we found this opportunity. Uh, so AJ uh, Del Fernandez, he was bringing this huge container that got stuck in Tampa. Uh, of Pelo de Oro coming from Peru, I think it was David of Pelo de Oro at the time. And then we started like blending stuff. And uh, and he actually used some of that tobacco in the H1 he just launched at the IPCPR. And and then I started blending that and we used that a little bit of the Pichado Classico, just a little bit because we cannot use much in that cigar. And then I put some Pelo de Oro uh, in some other blends we're developing for other clients. And then I said, you know what? What if we use our binder, Pelo de Oro from Ecuador, and um, and you know try with Pelo de Oro fillers on Peru? And we had a very we started a very small operation in Peru as well. And I said, you know, we gotta we gotta try this because I, I was in love with the tobacco. So we made the cigar, man, and I tried every single wrapper uh, in that cigar, and nothing worked. I put in a funnel, it didn't work. I even tried the own Pelo de Oro; it became extremely acidic like completely overpowering too. So I have to reduce, I didn't use any Lijero whatsoever, just Viso, just Viso, uh, one leaf of Seco. And I was looking for a very thin wrapper, something that wouldn't influence so much to the taste profile. And then Pichardo came with this idea of using the, the Sumatra, Sumatra. but I said Pichardo, Sumatra is, the flavor is so specific. We'll take, you know, we'll take over the Pelo de Oro. So no, not if we use the cut seven. I said, okay. So we got that cut seven with a very thin leaf. That's why the wrapper in the cigar is so delicate. And, and but for, for a 46 or 47 Bitola, it works. If you put this in a, a bigger Bitola, it 
doesn't work. So we start, we start using this wrapper actually for the Tiago splitter. We had to change and start using a cut two because you know, the, 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 the Tiago was kind of too thin and we are not afraid of saying this, you know, like I like to tell everybody uh, and, and we are, and we, we are, I was going to say we are humble enough, and then it sounds like I'm pri proud of being humble. <laughs> That's what I meant. Um, so we are, we are, we are okay. realistic. You're realistic enough. <laughs> we are okay, and we like criticism because if you read, if you truly are passionate about knowledge, you don't care if people are coming to you and say, "Hey, I don't like this," because I want to, I want to find out why he doesn't like this, and he might enlighten me, and I might learn something with him. So I'm. I'm more passionate about the truth than being right or the knowledge than being right. And again, we got, got one review from that cigar about the issue of the rapper and we immediately changed thanks to the person who rated our cigars and, and we have fun with it. Uh, and we are really proud with the Luciano and, and it's been a, a very good response that we have from, from the Thai industry. It is a very unique taste profile. Um, we produced, we have the, so there's a lot of confusion out there too. People say, oh, we made 25,000, we made 60,000. So we produced initially 25,000, but we have, we had tobacco enough to produce 60,000 for this year. Okay. Now, uh, of course, now we are planning and we are uh, producing that leaf. But remember, all the products we launch, we, we do have a lot of process aging. So what I'm, what I'm actually seeding right now, it's something that I'll be able to deliver maybe two or three years from now. So that's why it's a limit series. So we, we sold about 20,000 already of that cigar. Mm -hmm. So I, I, we have another 40,000 to go and, and that's it. So I, that's why I keep telling our reps and even to the stores, events I go with that. If you like that cigar, make sure you buy some boxes and keep them. Uh, because, you know, we were an out very, very shortly. I, I really enjoyed it. Um, as you know, uh, I was a very, I was a very big fan of it. I thought the, uh, just the overall, just the flavor nuances, how it just worked. I really love that format. Um, and I thought it really, the uniqueness of all the tobacco involved, specifically the Peruvian, um, really lent well and really balanced out the brand, uh, blend considerably. Um, but, uh, I, I, I'm, so I was, I was, I was very pleased, very, very pleased with it indeed. So, um, Luciano, I have one more question before we get to our curveball segment. Um, and our curveball segment's not even really – I call it a curveball because I'm a baseball guy, but I, I usually just throw <laughs> up a softball for someone to hit because it's just usually a fun question. Um, but uh, before that, where can, where can uh, people uh, get your cigars? And I know you don't have, like, all the list of all the retailers on, on hand or anything, but, uh, mm -hmm. you know, this was your first, first trade show. Did, did you land spots in all 50 states? Uh, how many states are you guys uh, available in? So we are in 32 states today. Um, wow. So we, I believe we, we did pretty well at the IPCPR. If you go to our website, which is very easy, aceprime.com, uh, there is a section there uh, that says where to buy. And then you can just have a zip code and we'll give you the closest brick mortar uh, to your place. If you, are, if you don't find any of those brick and mortar, we don't sell online but there is only one store in the entire country that is authorized to sell two lines. One is the Luciano and the MSS, um, which is Corona Cigars. So you go to coronacigars.com and then you can um, buy directly from, uh, from my friend, Jeff. Another great, I was going to say another great partnership and all the great partnerships that we've talked about tonight, Jeff Warshawitz, which what an incredible, uh, what an incredible uh, organization yeah, he has at Corona Cigar. Yep. Him and Tanya, they're amazing people, man. So, uh, Luciano, I have one last question for you. Like I said, it's my curveball segment. Now, I, I, I tend to sometimes prep my guests for this, but I, I, I thought that you'd have a really good answer for you. So I'm just kind of springing you on it a little bit. But I promise it's nothing too, uh, it's nothing too hardcore. We've talked about a lot of people tonight. Mm -hmm. And you've been really thankful and very grateful for the amazing partners and the people that have helped you along the way your experiences with Pope Francis, no less, and um, all these amazing relationships. So um, it may be a little hard for you to name or to narrow it down, but
but so I am actually going to give you the the freedom to do dead or alive on this. Okay. So the stand so the standard question is always like, if you could have dinner with five people, dead or alive, who would it be? No, I'm gonna I'm gonna change the experience. Mm -hmm. And it's who you could who the five this we're actually gonna go to the five people in history, dead or alive, mm -hmm. that you could share the Luciano the Traveler with and share that cigar with them, whether they're cigar smokers or not, but just this is your personal list, the five people dead or alive, who would it be? Man, that's a tough question. So, Pope Francis would be one of them, so. <laughs> I would love to see that. <laughs> yeah, so I gave him a, a, a box of cigars. And I heard from a common friend that he does smoke. So I hope, hopefully, he liked my cigars. Uh, but I would love to sit down with him and, and talk about life. And, and definitely, Pope Francis is, is one of them. I think the second one would be Nelson Mandela. I think he's a guy that we admire. And Desmond Tutu. It's a guy that I, uh, I admire a lot. Uh, so bringing down to earth, I would say um, a person that I never had the privilege of having a cigar with, but I know is a great connoisseur of cigars, and I'm, I'm, I was a huge fan of him for my entire life, and I'll have the opportunity actually next month to do that, is Michael Jordan. Okay. So uh, Michael Jordan is a, it's a, a, well, what people tells me, um, he uh, he's very much uh, into cigars, so he smokes a lot of cigars, and he usually goes to bold aged cigars. So everybody would think that he would just smoke Cubans and stuff, but apparently he smokes a lot of Nicaraguan cigars. And I'd love to listen to him and see what he likes in a cigar, and also learn about his journey. I mean, that guy is a is a is a legend, you know. Someone with the level of discipline and and he always said that he was so humble he, because he could have said, no, I'm a talented man. But I don't know if you notice his entire career, he's always branded himself as someone that put effort, that would stay after the, after the, the training and would kind of shoot 100 hoops before he go home or always doing some extra workout or always extra, always push himself to the limit. So in a lot of try and error, you know, in order for him to be the great player that he was, that guy, you know, bust his ass off. So I, I really admire him. I, I would love to smoke a cigar um, with him for sure. Did I name five or four? So uh, Desmond Tutu, Pope Francis, Nelson Mandela, Michael Jordan. So you got one more. So I would say, so here's the thing. I have a, I have a grandfather who actually raised me as his son, he adopted me, literally adopted me. I, uh, I have a, a complicated story, family story. But he, I was raised with my uncle as my brother, my father. When I was born, my father was uh, uh, eight. He was actually 17 years old. My mom was 19 and I'm mean, living a crazy life. Ended up being raised by my grandparents. And they adopted me um, from my parents which sounds weird uh, say adoption but it was literally adoption it was like paper adoption and uh so that legally he's my father but he's my grandfather he he's um he's actually a religious minister he's a pastor uh and a professor uh theologian the guy speaks seven different languages you know wrote a lot of books um but we never smoked cigar together so I think, I think one of the things I would love to do one day is, is try to explain to him cigars and eventually he accepting the, the, the challenge of trying it. And uh, if I could maybe, you know, have some time with him. He's 87 now, almost like 88. And I would love to kind of just have a cigar with my grandfather. But that, it's not about the opportunity to sit down with him. It's about convincing him to smoke a cigar. <laughs> That's the hard part. 
Maybe you should bring some of those lawyers you were mentioning earlier with you to kind of argue the case for you. <laughs> it, you know, Nelson Mandela is a name that gets thrown around a lot at these kinds of questions. You know, like who would you sit down yeah. to dinner with and things like that. He's such a he's such a prominent person in history, and 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 him and Desmond Tutu, who I have a great affinity for. I've read a lot about him as well. Mm -hmm. um, um, you know, it, this kind of transformation happened to Mandela later in life, uh, mm -hmm. and that in the in the in the embrace of the word forgiveness but desmond tutu uh, you know if we can get off on this tangent for a second just because that that struck a chord with me mm -hmm. um because i have such a profound respect for him um from a historical aspect and and just uh, just as a man the the idea of forgiveness and uh and what he he said without forgiveness you can't move forward and so his his big thing um as a as an anti-apartheid leader and then eventual you know shaper of the the new government in south africa was was was, was forgiveness he even led uh, you know to, they were kind of not like tribunals but hearings mm -hmm. and he it, you know and they were it was it was all geared toward forgiveness of of the oppressors and it was i, I mean just just incredibly powerful um the words and actions that he actually put into place when it was a, a time that for, you know, revenge or retribution, or, you know, there could have, they, it could have gone so many different ways and it could have ended up, you know, it could have ended just so terribly, you know, here was this, this man that, uh, that, that pushed, uh, pushed forgiveness first. And, and, uh, and he, uh, what a great man. I, I would, I would absolutely share a cigar with him, but I would absolutely just, I would just absolutely love to share some words with him. But uh, yeah. that's quite a list. That's quite a list. And your yeah. grandfather, your grandfather slash father is probably the most difficult. Uh, probably the most difficult. <laughs> to, to probably convinced in that regard. I, I heard Nelson Mandela was a smoker. Um, maybe I'm wrong about that, but, uh, but uh, that probably yeah. wouldn't have been a too hard of a push. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but that's interesting. I, and hopefully uh, Pope Francis liked uh, your cigars as well. Yeah. Um, but I, Luciana, I, I, I cannot thank you enough for what a wonderful evening this has been. Uh, truly tremendous to sit down with you. Uh, I learned so much um, in particular, and, and you've, I, 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 I'm anxious to have you back because I feel like there's so much more to unwrap uh, with, uh, with your background and, and, and what you guys will be doing going forward. I'm really excited that uh, the new MXS line with Adrian Gonzalez and, and a woman ambassador, which will you'll be announcing, I'm, I'm assuming shortly as well. That's really exciting as well about women empowerment. I think it's, I think it's tremendous. The project that you guys are doing, the work that you guys are doing, um, truly enjoyed the cigars. I'm, I'm really excited to see what you guys do going forward. So it's, uh, I'm wishing you nothing but the best. And uh, I look forward to seeing you at this next year's PCA uh, trade show. Um, and, uh, but to hopefully talking to you sooner than that. So. Thank you very much, my friend. It's my honor to be, uh, to be with you and I, I like I said I had a great impression from our conversations always open to talk open to uh, do things like this I would love to talk a little more and again it's all about love you know it's all about love absolutely so thank you so much for everyone who tuned in and hung out with us tonight we really appreciate it uh, you are listening to us because of exclusively because of Drew Estate and uh, if you're listening to us later on any podcast form whether that be Apple Pod, Apple Podcasts Spotify Google Play Podbean or wherever you listen to podcasts you're listening to us exclusively because of Cornelius and Anti Premium Cigars this has been our 97th take 97 I've done 97 of these and it just keeps getting better I keep having amazing guests week in and week out just like our esteemed guest tonight, Luciano Mayrellis of Ace Prime Cigars. I really want to thank him for his time tonight and uh, thank you all for joining us. It's been a tremendous on the road to 100. So as always, I'm Barry Duplissy. This was Take 97 in the books. Guess what, everyone? We'll see you next time. <laughs>